also like in Jupiter now. There you go. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Arturo Aceves. I am the director for International Business Development for Philadelphia International Medicine. I'm just going to take a few minutes to introduce what we are, what we do, and then I'm gonna leave the panel for Dr. Alvarado and Dr. Ruiz, who very kindly are taking this time to today to talk about, about prostate cancer. Okay, so just one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, there you go. Thank you again. Um, this session is being hosted by the Panama Clinic, which is one of the, one, our closest ally in Central America, a fantastic place that is being developed over there with top-notch technology, top-notch physicians, and we're very proud to, to be able to partner with them. And uh, I want to also give you uh, a welcoming to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is known as the city of ads and meds, and the reason is because we have seven medical schools, 22 nursing schools, two dental schools, over 100 hospitals and over 100 universities. Actually, uh, we were one of the, one of either, though we were very close to the epicentric of this pandemic, we've been able to really um, contain the situation and, and the city has come together really close with all, all of the people working here in Philadelphia to be able to keep all the people safe in here. 30% um, of the population in Philadelphia area works in, in uh, life sciences. So this has been an advantage for us. What do we do in Philadelphia International Medicine? We are owned by three academic centers, Jefferson Health, Fox Chase Cancer Center, and Temple Health, obviously, where uh, Dr. Reese is part of, of the staff. Uh, but we also represent seven healthcare systems more. We, we work facilitating physicians uh, this kind of events, medical events, but also we facilitate and that is our part to facilitate for patients, international patients to come to Philadelphia to receive the best care, right? So we facilitate long uh, clinical treatment for long distance co-management of patients with high comorbidity cases, lung cancer, prostate cancer, lung transplant, uh, glioblastoma treatment, any type of treatment from neonatology, pediatrics to, to the, the harder uh, type of cancers. We also do medical education where we collaborate from, with physicians from all over the world and also do consulting services. So we're very proud to be able to facilitate and to work with, with our allies in Panama Clinic to, to have these conversations and to be able to get physicians from all over the world closer to be able to help their patients. Now, a really quick Housekeeping item uh, for everybody joining the session, please be mindful that we have our chat and uh, Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So any questions, please write them in there and we're gonna be able to read them at the end of the session. We're gonna have 20 minutes for Dr. Osvarado uh, presentation. We're gonna have also 20 minutes for Dr. Reese's presentation. And at the end, we will answer your questions. Well, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna let Dr. Alvarado to take over the panel. Thank you and welcome everybody. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening. Good evening to all of you. And thank you, Arturo, for the introduction. And also, I, I'm more than pleased to introduce uh, one of the most talented uh, urologists in, 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 in the United States now, which is uh, our friend Adam Rees. And he's a professor of urology at uh, Temple University and chief of urologic oncology at the Temple University Hospital and he's the director of the urology residency uh, program. He's gonna be sharing uh, our talk today and we, we have chosen uh, a topic that it's very uh, unique and changing, you know, in the last few years and the uh, approach of, of it has changed and has given a new window for opportunity of how to treat uh, patients with uh, prostate cancer. But the first part of the talk, I will speak a little bit about uh, uh, how the, the prostate biopsy and how the new technology has impacted this and how we are using this in order to uh, improve the, the quality of life and the new uh, options of, of therapy. Uh, 
There we go. Okay, yeah, as we all know, the prostate cancer is the second most commonly uh, cancer in, in, in men and the, sec and the fourth uh, uh, worldwide. But we know now that uh, it, it is a diverse uh, spectrum of disease with uh, clinical behavior going from a well-differentiated non-invasive tumor to a high-grade uh, metastatic cancer with uh, significant morbidity, mortality, and costs. A prostate biopsy is the gold standard uh, method to confirm the presence of cancer, but also for us as uh, professionals uh, the, in this battle against prostate cancer, our difficult as physician is selecting the right patient to be screened, the right patient to be biopsied, how to biopsy the patient and how to treat this patient. So in these uh, areas, imaging uh, will be critical as we've learned uh, throughout uh, the, the last few years. Traditionally, uh, prostate biopsy in the clinical practice uh, has been indicated because an abnormal rectal exam increased PSA and clinical suspicion of uh, prostatic cancer. But the decision to proceed with biopsy is complex uh, as being evolving and should be made on an individualized uh, basis. The PSA is a helper for sure. It is an important biomarker that uh, correlates uh, with the risk of PSA for uh, prostate cancer, sorry. And also is a marker that uh, will help us with the uh, evaluation of the outcome of the treatment. But the screening has been shown to reduce mortality. However, its utility as uh, uh, it's highly age uh, dependent. The threshold uh, that to prompt to a biopsy has not been precisely established owing to the variety of uh, problems that may cause uh, increased uh, or increments on the PSA. Uh, but it is true that prostate cancer also, uh, the risk exists at any PSA level. Level. I mean, the AUA has established certain uh, recommendations who to screen how to screen the patients and avoid the, the in young patients. And in those that we decide to go for the uh, screening and uh, potentially biopsy, the decision should be shared among the physician and the patient and does not recommend a, a single uh, PSA cutoff level that should prompt a biopsy. Uh, but there are certain other tools that can be used in combination as the density, the ratio of, uh, between pre and total PSA, the risk of every patient, uh, risk calculators, and also the consideration of, instead of being annual, being a, B, a, a biennial interval for uh, the uh, examination or evaluation of these patients. By the other hand, uh, the National Cancer uh, Comprehensive Network uh, established recently that uh, re based on the uh, uh, reasonably uh, evidence that men within an age risk with a PSA greater than three nanograms uh, are supported by the trials and or four nanograms if decide to continue screening after 75 years old should undergo a prostate biopsy in their, in their version of two, uh, two, 2019. Traditionally, as I said, the uh, biopsy guided by ultrasound has been the standard approach. A number of samples goes all over from six to 24 cores. Uh, if you use saturation, and there are several studies uh, where compared the cancer detection rates among the number of cores uh, that has been taken, uh, but there's nothing uh, completely uh, established or written in that sense. Uh, because the sensitivity or the, the, of, the, of the number of cores uh, has not been really uh, clearly established. The, the last uh, thing was uh, the study for Brock, from Brock uh, who found a clinically significant cancer detection rate of about uh, almost 40% in men with elevated PSA using 12 core systemic biopsy, uh, which is uh, more or less what Aguilar and the other uh, uh, colleagues uh, have established. However, however, the traditional approach of uh, rectal exam and PSA to inform the decision to biopsy as described uh, before, lacks of sensitivity and specificity for cancer leading to a relatively high rate of unnecessary biopsies as established in the, this study published by Thompson in 2014. 
it was followed by some other uh, studies in the European uh, 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 setting where uh, they studied uh, 16 st uh, uh, studies with almost 2,000 men and they found that uh, the magnetic resonance had a higher rate of detection of significant prostate cancer, a numbers above 90%, and a lower rate of detection of insignificant prostate cancer in a number uh, which must be considered. Uh, being like that, the MRI have enabled non-invasive assessment of the prostate for suspicious lesions. And uh, the way to be reported was standardized by the European Society of Urogenital Radiology uh, in year 2015 through the development of the prostate imaging reporting and data system, the famous PIRATS uh, uh, two that we are using nowadays. And as we know, the patient with uh, PIRATS four or five must be biopsied. The three, which is an intermediate or uh, could be evaluated and discussed or followed up and patients with uh, very low risk are periods one and two. I'm not gonna enter in details of that. And there are several studies also published in different uh, uh, journals that uh, supported uh, this in X number of uh, patients as well. S the same way, uh, there are a couple of uh, trials. One is the PROMISE that was uh, released in 2017 and uh, where the application of the multiparametric re magnetic resonance in pre-biopsy lesion characterization had the potential to revolutionize the prostate cancer screening uh, because they compare the accuracy of the biopsy and the MRI against a reference test. And uh, they could have eliminated 25% uh, of patients from undergoing a prostate biopsy based on the findings on the MRI with a high sensitivity, uh, relatively low uh, specificity and a, a positive predictive value of uh, about 50% and a normal predictive value of uh, 89, which is a pretty high one. Also uh, by year 2018, the, another study called Precision uh, evaluated 100, uh, 500 men who under, underwent either uh, resonance and then targeted biopsy or standard transrectal biopsy. And they found that the MRI was superior at limiting the amount of men who needed biopsies and the discovery or more significant, uh, clinically significant cancer, which is also of paramount importance. Also, uh, there is a review, Cochrane review by, published by DROST in 2019 compared different, um, the diagnostic performance of four index tests to a, a template guided a biopsy reference. Uh, it was a large study, 43 studies with uh, uh, thousands of men, and it included four ways of uh, evaluating the MRI, uh, MRI alone, MRI guided biopsy, the MRI uh, pathway, which was uh, the combination of MRI with or without subsequent MRI guided biopsy and the systematic uh, transrectal ultrasound biopsy. And the finding, the key finding of the study was that the MRI pathway evidenced the strongest diagnostic performance in detection of a clinically significant uh, prostate cancer with a pool sensitivity of 72 and specificity of 96%. The MRI pathway notably outperformed uh, the systemic biopsy with a 12% greater likelihood of identifying clinically significant uh, cancer in this uh, group. And this study also uh, notably uh, uh, concluded that this MRI pathway could reduce the overdiagnosis of low-grade cancer while improving the detection of significant cancer. And the MRI uh, preceding biopsy represents the preferred diagnostic strategy for most uh, patients. Being like this, also the American Urological Association changed their position about a update and updated their policy statement in December of last year. And they said that there is enough uh, data to support the use of prostate MRI in all men before their initial prostate biopsy when the MRI is of sufficient quality. That has to do with the center where it is performed, that there are differences, and the people who read it, it's uh, reader dependent as well. 
So that's why it's an area of expertise, it's an area of uh, uh, being into this in order to give uh, good uh, uh, reports or results. Same way, uh, the National Cancer uh, uh, um, uh, Network uh, guidelines uh, in 2019, they suggested that MRI targeting can be considered in those centers with availability and experience and expertise in uh, uh, interpretation and targeting and it can be used to select the patients for biopsy and to guide needle placement, reducing the number of men undergoing biopsy, reducing the detection of indolent disease, improving the detection of uh, um, uh, the, 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 the serious disease through targeted biopsies because we could direct uh, the, the, the lesions uh, particularly in that way. So they also consider it in case of atypia, or suspicious for cancer on our high-grade uh, pin uh, to uh, either focal or multifocal in the follow-up of uh, these uh, patients. Uh, the, it, it involves, uh, with no doubt, uh, the, the uh, selecting sampling of, of lesions. And there are three ways or methods to evaluate the process with uh, an MRI to decide this. One is the direct MRI-guided in-bore biopsy. Uh, that has great results, but the drawback is the cost and investment and the expertise on that. The cognitive fusion biopsy, which is probably the most popular nowadays in, in many places, many countries and many centers. And uh, what it's the real uh, game changer that has been the MRI transrectal or transperineal fusion biopsy, as we are doing with the number of equipments that we have available nowadays. The MRI, uh, by using the cognitive fusion prostate biopsy, the MRI identifies the regions of interest, and then uh, the operator manually targets these lesions during the ultrasound using the anatomical landmarks apparent on the ultrasound with uh, reference to the MRI previously taken. Uh, there are a couple of studies that support this uh, technique. It's pretty easy and accessible to many people nowadays, but requires uh, knowledge of uh, the how to read the MRI, how to interpret that MRI and put it together with the ultrasound done at the time of, of the procedure. Uh, it's, uh, but, and there are disadvantages that depend obviously in the operator of, uh, of, the, of the procedure. And also there is a point about the small uh, lesions that can be missed, easily missed with the uh, ultrasound. The fusion biopsy, which is uh, what is really, as I said initially, the game changer, involved using different software platforms to integrate the MRI to uh, data to ultrasound for more accurate biopsies. It have continually been proven to be more effective at detecting uh, clinically significant prostate cancer in comparison with the standard uh, systematic biopsy as uh, established in uh, several studies also. The disadvantage is uh, that it requires specially, specialized uh, uh, operator training and involves an additional device. Obviously, that change or limits the number of people who uh, will be suitable for performing it and the need for investment in uh, new equipment. Uh, the future trial, uh, which is a trial comparing, comparing the different options or the different uh, 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 equipments that we have uh, nowadays, uh, the authors did not find any significant differences in overall and clinically significant detection between the three groups, the ones that were also uh, uh, randomized uh, using fusion biopsy, trans uh, rectal fusion biopsy, cognitive uh, biopsies, or MRI in board. So they were basically uh, about the same in detecting in the in the uh, detection of uh, overall cancer or clinically significant uh, prostate cancer, uh, and as no difference in detection rates were found, they recommended evaluating the unique factors related to each technique, expense, local expertise, need for anesthesia when deciding which technique is the best for a determined patient. If you uh, you don't have the expertise on this, don't do it. Use or do whatever you, 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 you know how to do it. And uh, there are several platforms developed uh, for this purpose to help with the 
uh, fusion biopsies. One of them, probably the most popular is the Artemis and then Urona by in vivo, Eurostation by Coelis and some others like uh, any, any uh, ultrasound uh, uh, um, uh, manufacturer has put a little bit of this on their products uh, nowadays. The Artemis that we have here in Panama Clinic, uh, it does incorporate a, 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 a multimodality software and converts the 2D image of the MRI into a 3D image that is superimposed on the uh, images from the ultrasound, allowing us to localize uh, in a focused manner the lesions discovered on the MRI in an office setting. Uh, there is a learning curve associated with the urologist using the Artemis, and it can be used for transrectal or transperineal uh, biopsy. The Euronab, which is the, another competitor of this, used electromagnetic guidance instead of the well, interposition of that. And it was developed by the National, in the in National Institute of Health in collaboration with Philips Healthcare. And it, uh, they, 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 they said that it increased in 30% the, the identification of high-risk cancers with targeted biopsies as uh, published in JAMA in 2015. But uh, the, the overall cancer detection rate by using the Euronav, which initially was developed or the studies were developed to be used uh, transperineal, uh, the uh, cancer detection rate uh, was found around 80% with clinically significant cancer uh, by using this piece of equipment. Uh, the Eurostation by Coelis is a European version of this. Uh, it, it uses real-time 3D uh, transrectal ultrasound image and the 3D uh, fusion guidance to allow the urologist to move the ultrasound probe, probe to get the, the correct biopsies. And there's a couple of studies also that supports uh, their versatility and their uh, success in uh, detecting uh, cancer. This platform, yes, these platforms have several unique differences. However, there's no, uh, no, there's no data uh, to compare uh, the, the, the fusion biopsy uh, systems. And this technology continues to mature and use uh, becomes more spread uh, throughout the world. Uh, the question now comes also in how to use it, whether transperineal or transrectal biopsy, and there is a lot of controversy on this. Uh, the cancer detection rate and overall complication rate are comparable between the both uh, groups, and major complications might occur more frequently in the transrectal biopsy groups, uh, particularly infections, that is uh, um, uh, in, uh, published in this study. And uh, the, but the, the transperineal seemed to be more complex, painful, and had a higher probability of being interrupted by uh, com anesthesia complications or uh, requiring uh, in the post-op uh, Foley catheters. The transrectal biopsy is very, uh, feel that it's very well known for urologists. The vast majority of us were trained into this. Uh, it's quite convenient for the provider. It uh, can be done either local anesthesia or general anesthesia, and it's very familiar. Uh, the, the main thing on this is uh, the risk of infection and the use of fluoroquinolones or other broader uh, antibiotics. As uh, with the transperineal, we don't have to use almost uh, any uh, major antibiotics before or after the procedure because there is a low rate. However, uh, these patients undergoing transperineal seem to be better results uh, with lesions based on the apex or in the anterior part, and they have a higher risk of uh, urinary retention poison. Having said this, the prostate uh, biopsy remains the cornerstone of uh, the diagnosis of prostate cancer, and uh, the, the and it's widely used in their diagnosis. Nowadays, the indication goes from uh, gross uh, rectal abnormality for a PSA that has changed uh, on, on the time with a velocity, or it's uh, about four nanograms in the high risk age group, or lesions with periods uh, four or five on uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, the lesions on three, as I said, have an, a, an equivocal uh, cancer risk, and the application of uh, magnetic resonance to the diagnosis and follow up of prostate cancer has the potential to revolutionize the current uh, uh, practice and emerging data highlight uh, and use as a triage uh, tool, same as surveillance of these patients as we will discuss uh, with Dr. Adam Rees uh, later on.
uh, the techniques of fusion uh, has changed and seem to be superior to the historical standard of care uh, transrectal biopsies and is associated with a uh, high uh, cancer detection rate, eliminating uh, unnecessary systematic prostate biopsies for patients with uh, elevated PSA. And uh, the platforms seem to be, uh, there's no studies to compare one to the other. So all of them seem to have advantages. And as more data uh, emerges, uh, we have to reach a consensus uh, because uh, the, uh, about the, the pre a biopsy a imaging of the prostate and how this affect uh, the, the selection. However, uh, nowadays year 2020 seems to be uh, the best option. The holy grail has not been found in terms of diagnosis, surveillance of uh, focal therapy. The future strategies uh, involve the seven Tesla MRI, genomics, radiomics, contrasted ultrasound, neural nets, but we don't know where we're gonna get. But the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones, as just Maynard Keynes said. Uh, thank you very much. And I will uh, uh, give the word to uh, Adam, to, who will speak to us about the use of the fusion uh, biopsy uh, in the uh, new uh, concept of active surveillance for prostate cancer patients. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Alvarado, for uh, your kind introduction at the beginning of your talk and for the excellent uh, introductory talk. Um, let me see if I can get my slides here. Um, uh, okay. Can you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, so as Dr. Alvarado mentioned, um, I'm going to focus a little bit on a specific indication for the use of MRI ultrasound biopsy, and that's uh, specifically in the setting of men undergoing active surveillance for low-risk prostate cancer. Um, and so in my talk, I'm going to cover sort of four basic questions about uh, the use of this MRI ultrasound technology in the active surveillance setting. Uh, the first two questions that I'm going to answer together are going to be, number one, what is the value of fusion biopsy in confirmatory prostate biopsy for patients enrolled in active surveillance? And then I'm going to uh, answer the question of what is the optimal technique for the performance of these fusion prostate biopsies in patients on active surveillance? Um, so before I launch into a, a review of the, the literature and a re review of the studies we're going to talk about, I do want to make sure we have the terminology uh, clear of exactly what I'm talking about. So I put together sort of a standard schematic that a patient would experience in his journey on active surveillance. Um, so obviously, uh, patients are undergo their initial biopsy when they're initially diagnosed with cancer. And I'm going to refer to that throughout the talk as the diagnostic biopsy. And at least here in the United States, and I don't know about where many of you practice, but, but very often that diagnostic biopsy still is done with a systematic transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, not with MRI ultrasound fusion. Um, if that patient has low risk disease and is considered a potential candidate for active surveillance, it's typically recommended that that patient undergo a second biopsy somewhere within six to 12 months of the initial biopsy. And I'm gonna to refer to that biopsy throughout this talk as a confirmatory biopsy. And the real purpose of that biopsy is to identify patients with higher grade tumors that might have been missed on the initial diagnostic biopsy. And if we do find those higher grade cancers, then probably that patient is not gonna be the ideal candidate for active surveillance. So we're gonna talk about what is the utility of the MRI ultrasound fusion technology in this confirmatory biopsy setting. Now, once the patient undergoes that confirmatory biopsy, if it confirms that they do in fact appear to have low grade cancer, then they're placed on a surveillance regimen. And then depending on the program, it's typically recommended that those patients undergo repeat biopsy somewhere on the order of every one to three years thereafter. And these um, every one to three year biopsies, I'm gonna to refer to as surveillance biopsies throughout the remainder of the talk. And these are mainly to identify, uh, you know, again, either patients with a, a small low grade tumor that might've been missed on the prior biopsies or patients who develop de novo higher risk disease while they're being surveilled for their prostate cancer. Um, so, you know, one of the first questions I wanted to answer is, can this MRI ultrasound fusion technology allow us to identify more patients with higher grade disease at the time of either confirmatory or surveillance biopsy? Because clearly, 
if patients have these higher grade tumors, we're gonna to wanna to find that on biopsy and we're gonna to want to exclude them from our surveillance protocols and recommend that they undergo more aggressive treatment either with surgery, radiation therapy or other definitive treatment modalities. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna walk us through two studies that attempted to answer this question. Uh, the first study was out of the Johns Hopkins group. This was published in European Urology several years ago. And what they did is they wanted to investigate the value of fusion biopsy in the confirmatory and surveillance biopsy setting for patients on active surveillance. So they looked at 157 patients. Um, of these, 54 were undergoing confirmatory biopsy and the remaining 103 were undergoing surveillance biopsy. Uh, it's important to recognize that at the time of biopsy, all men underwent both a targeted biopsy and a standard systematic biopsy. So they took somewhere on the order of three to four cores of any concerning lesion seen on MRI and they went, then went ahead and did the standard sort of 12 core systematic biopsy that typically would be done in the absence of uh, the MRI results. Uh, they then wanted to look at the rates of upgrading to Gleason 3 plus 4 disease and see what percentage of those cases were found on the targeted biopsy and compare that to what percentage were found on the standard or systematic biopsy. Um, so this uh, figure shows the, their confirmatory biopsy results. So of the 54 patients who underwent confirmatory biopsy, 12 or about 22% were found to be upgraded to Gleason 7 or higher. Uh, now of those upgrades, 50% of them were upgraded based on the results of the systematic biopsy alone. Um, an additional 25% were upgraded based on the results both from the systematic biopsy and the targeted biopsy. And only 25% were upgraded based on the targeted biopsy alone. Um, when they looked at their surveillance biopsy patients, the results were relatively similar. So of the 103 patients undergoing a surveillance biopsy, about 24% of them were upgraded to Gleason 7 disease. Again, the majority of these, 72%, were found based on the results of the systematic transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy alone. 12% were found uh, both on the systematic and the targeted biopsy and only 16% of the upgrades were found based on the results of the targeted biopsy alone. So these authors concluded from their study that the addition of the targeted biopsies based on the MRI results did increase the detection of high-grade tumors, but only by about 3.9% compared to a standard biopsy alone. And they therefore concluded that the standard biopsy is needed in addition to the targeted biopsy in order to maximize the detection of Gleason upgrading for patients on surveillance. Um, they then sort of wanted to explain why they found these potentially somewhat disappointing results uh, from the fusion biopsies, and they hypothesized the following reasons. So first of all, uh, as we all know, compared to a general population undergoing biopsy for an elevated PSA, your active surveillance population is going to be enriched with, with mostly low-grade cancers, which tend to be smaller and therefore less likely to be visible on MRI. Uh, their other potential explanation is at Johns Hopkins, they use PSA density as one of their eligibility criteria, and they only allow men with a relatively low PSA density to enroll in active surveillance. So men with a low PSA, PSA density are gonna to tend to have larger prostates, smaller tumors, and therefore those lesions are gonna be much less likely to be visible on MRI. Um, so a very similar study was done at uh, the University of California, San Francisco. This was also published in European Urology, and they had uh, a similar objective, which was to identify the value of this fusion biopsy technique in patients on active surveillance. Um, so this study looked at 207 men on surveillance undergoing either confirmatory or surveillance biopsy. Similar to the last study at Hopkins, all men underwent both a targeted biopsy, but also, also a standard systematic biopsy. And again, they reported their rates of upgrading to Gleason 7 disease or higher and looked at how many of those cases were found on the systematic compared to the targeted biopsy. Um, so in this study, they found upgrading in about 40% of men undergoing biopsy. Of those cases that were upgraded, 59% were found on systematic biopsy alone, 36% were found on targeted biopsy alone, and only about 5% were found on both systematic and targeted biopsy. So importantly, they, they, or they found that the targeted biopsy would have missed 39 patients who were found to be upgraded based on the results of the systematic biopsy, uh, 
However, the targeted biopsy also detected an additional 34 patients with high-grade disease that would not have been detected had systematic biopsy alone been performed. Um, so, you know, to answer these questions, what is the value of this technique in patients on active surveillance and what's the optimal technique? Well, I think these studies show that the MRI ultrasound fusion targeted biopsies do increase the detection of high-grade tumors in, in patients on active surveillance who are undergoing either confirmatory or surveillance biopsy. However, when you're performing the biopsy, the targeted biopsy alone is not sufficient. And if you really want to detect the maximum number of men with higher grade tumors, you really need to perform the systematic biopsy in addition to the targeted biopsy. Um, so the, the next question I wanted to answer is for men that are on active surveillance, can MRI replace prostate biopsy? And so the, the sort of rationale behind this is, as we're all aware, uh, prostate biopsy is a potentially morbid procedure. There is a, a not inconsequential rate of infection after prostate biopsy. Um, secondly, patients really don't like prostate biopsy. Um, unfortunately, I have a number of men who are not compliant with their recommended surveillance prostate biopsies. This leads to a number of men being lost to follow-up. And these men that are lost to follow-up, potentially their cancer could progress to an uncurable stage while they're on surveillance if, if we don't follow these patients closely. So the question here is, is MRI a strategy that's less invasive yet equally effective in following men on active surveillance? And can this potentially allow us to avoid prostate biopsy? Um, so one way to answer this question is basically to dig a little bit deeper into the results of the, the prior two studies that I discussed earlier in my talk. And so one of the things that they reported is they said, okay, let's look at the men that had no lesion seen on the MRI whatsoever. So a completely reassuring MRI. And what was the rate of upgrading to Gleason 7 or higher just based on the results of the systematic biopsy alone? And so the Hopkins study found that they had 127 men who had a completely normal MRI and the rate of upgrading to three plus four or higher was about 10% in these 127 men. And those results were, were very similar to the results of the UCSF study that found a 9% risk of Gleason upgrading in men that had an essentially negative prostate MRI. So these results would suggest that MRI alone is not sufficient to replace or completely eliminate prostate biopsy when you're surveilling your patients on active surveillance. Um, another study that potentially looked at this question in a little more detail was published just this past year in European Urology. Uh, this was published out of the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. Um, and they asked the question that for patients with multiple MRIs and stable MRI findings over time, can biopsy be omitted in those patients? And can we perform only biopsy in patients in whom have a, uh, they have a worsening lesion on serial MRI over time? So the way they conducted this study is they looked at 207 of their patients that were on active surveillance. So in order to get into their active surveillance program, all of these men had to have already had a confirmatory biopsy prior to active surveillance enrollment. On both the diagnostic and the confirmatory biopsy, they had to have had Gleason 6 disease. And all men had a baseline MRI before they were even enrolled in active surveillance at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, now, the way they performed their surveillance protocol is they then repeated that MRI at 18 months after enrollment in their surveillance program, and then they performed a surveillance prostate biopsy, again, both with targeted biopsy and with a systematic biopsy, somewhere between two and four years after enrollment in their active surveillance program. And so uh, what they found was they found a 32% rate of Gleason upgrading to three plus four on the surveillance biopsy. But unfortunately, they found that increases in the PIRAD score on MRI were not significantly associated with the likelihood of Gleason upgrading. Uh, the p-value was only 0 0.9. And this table shows the results in a little bit more detail. So basically, it says on the left, it says, let's look at the patient's PIRAD score on their baseline MRI. So at the time that they enrolled in active surveillance. And then the MRI was repeated 18 months later. And they said, OK, did that score decrease? remain stable or increase? And then what was the likelihood of them having Gleason 7 disease or higher when the biopsy was performed? So if you look at the group of men that had a PIRAD score of three on their initial MRI, and then on an MRI 18 months later, that score either decreased or remained stable. So this is a group that we would consider to be relatively low risk and potentially say that maybe they don't need a biopsy. Uh, 
Well, unfortunately, in this group, the rate of Gleason upgrading was still 28%, even in the presence of either a stable or a, a, a decreasing pi red score on MRI. Uh, if you look at an even lower risk group, so these are patients who their baseline pi red score was two or less. And if it, if it remained stable on that MRI 18 months later, so they, they had an unchanging and reassuring MRI, the risk of Gleason upgrading in these patients was still about 16%. Um, so what these authors concluded is that if you develop a strategy of biopsying only for changes on MRI, you would avoid a lot of biopsies. You would be able to avoid about 681 biopsies per 1,000 men. But unfortunately, you would also miss a lot of Gleason upgrading. So per 1,000 men, you would miss about 169 patients with higher grade tumors. So they therefore concluded that although, although MRI is a useful adjunct when performing surveillance biopsies for men on active surveillance, MRI alone cannot completely replace the routine surveillance biopsy that we typically perform in these patients. Um, so the last question that I wanted to answer is, okay, well maybe MRI can't completely replace surveillance biopsies, but can it potentially help us to dictate how often surveillance biopsies should be performed? Um, and you know, so basically the thought behind this is if I have a reassuring MRI, can I space out my surveillance biopsies a little more and say, sir, you don't need to come back for another three or four years for your surveillance biopsy because your MRI is reassuring. <clears throat> so a couple studies have looked at this. This was a group out of uh, the Netherlands, uh, out of the, the Prius cohort. Uh, and so they looked at 210 men on active surveillance. All of these patients had Gleason 6 disease. Um, again, these men were undergoing either a confirmatory or a surveillance biopsy. The way they performed their biopsies was somewhat different. In all of the prior studies I discussed, all men underwent both a targeted biopsy and a systematic biopsy. Uh, in this study, that was the case for those men that were undergoing a confirmatory biopsy. They had both the systematic and the targeted biopsy. But for most men that were having a surveillance biopsy, they only performed a targeted biopsy of the MRI lesion. Uh, in these men, a systematic biopsy could be performed at the request of the referring urologist, but in general, most of these men underwent a targeted biopsy only. Um, so if you look at the results of their targeted biopsies, here what they do is they stratify patients by PIRAD score, but also by PSA density. So in the targeted biopsies, obviously no biopsy was performed if there was no lesion seen on MRI. But if you look at the PIRADS 3 group, what they found is if you have a PIRAD score of three, and your PSA density is less than 0.15, none of those patients were upgraded to Gleason 7 disease. However, if you had a pi red score of three, but your PSA density was greater than 0.15, about 50% of those patients were upgraded to Gleason 3 plus four or more aggressive disease. So they said that PSA density, in addition to your MRI findings, is a very important predictor when determining the need for prostate biopsy. Uh, here they show the results of their systematic biopsies. Um, so again, here you see that if you had a low PIRAD score or a low PSA density, your likelihood of Gleason upgrading was very, very low. But if you have a PIRAD score of three and a PSA density greater than 0.15, or if you have higher PIRAD scores of score of four or five, then your risk of, of Gleason upgrading increases significantly. So these authors concluded that the surveillance biopsy could potentially be delayed for patients that have a PIRAD score less than or equal to three and a PSA density less than 0.15, suggesting that the combination of the PSA density and the pi red score data is really valuable in predicting the outcome of your biopsy. Um, the last study that I wanna review is this study that was out of uh, Peter Pinto's group at the NIH um, outside of Washington, DC. And so they wanted to ask the question, how do the results of an MRI ultrasound fusion confirmatory biopsy predict the outcome of a patient who's going to be on, uh, placed on active surveillance. So what they did is they looked at 542 patients referred to their program for surveillance. All of these patients underwent confirmatory biopsy with MRI ultrasound fusion, and they had a significant percentage, about 22% of their patients that had no cancer whatsoever detected on this confirmatory biopsy. And they said, okay, let's compare this group that has a, had a completely negative confirmatory biopsy to the group of patients who had persistent cancer detected on their confirmatory biopsy. Let's follow these groups, two groups over time and see if there's a difference for how long they remain on active surveillance and how likely they are to be upgraded on subsequent biopsies. Um, so this Kaplan-Meier curve shows those two results. So on the left, 
This is the time over which patients remained on active surveillance. The red curve is those that had a negative confirmatory fusion biopsy, and the blue curve, those that had a positive confirmatory fusion biopsy. And they found that the negative biopsy group remained on active surveillance for a significantly longer period of time than the positive fusion biopsy group. Uh, the curve on the right is the um, progression-free survival, which they defined as a, a failure to identify Gleason 7 disease or higher. And similarly, outcomes were significantly better in the group that underwent a negative fusion biopsy compared to a positive fusion biopsy. Um, so from this paper, the authors concluded that surveillance biopsy can potentially be delayed in patients that have a negative confirmatory fusion biopsy. <clears throat> so what can we conclude from these studies? So I think um, these studies are fairly convincing in that the MRI targeted biopsy can certainly be a use useful adjunct in detecting higher grade disease for men at the time of confirmatory or surveillance biopsy on active surveillance. However, the systematic transrectal ultrasound biopsy really cannot be omitted if you really want to detect the maximum number of patients with high-grade tumors. Um, the MRI itself certainly can be useful in following, on patient, in following patients on active surveillance, but unfortunately, MRI alone cannot entirely replace the periodic surveillance transrectal ultrasound biopsy. And finally, I do think the MRI findings can be used to help tailor the frequency of surveillance biopsies. So as we saw in these last several studies, certainly men that have a negative MRI and a low PSA density, or those that have a negative confirmatory fusion biopsy, that's a, a lower risk group of men. And potentially we can do surveillance biopsy less frequently uh, in those patients. Um, so that's the end of my talk. I, I certainly appreciate the time and, and allowing me to speak today. And uh, I believe we're gonna open it up for questions at this point, so thank you. Well, thank you, Adam. And uh, again, let's uh, open the, the, the table for questions or comments. Uh, nowadays, obviously, there are certain new tools that has emerged uh, to treat this uh, prostate cancer. And I guess one of the promising, and especially in this time that we are living now in some countries as, as ours, that uh, uh, we had to do some uh, uh, forced active surveillance in some patients because mm -hmm. The access uh, for elective treatment of certain problems has been delayed because of COVID. And I guess over there, you have had the same uh, kind of situations. I've been participating in some other tables where they said about uh, the, the same thing. Uh, how, how do you monitor your patients and your, uh, after you know seeing this? How do you do in your program or you do have like uh, running any study on it? Yeah, so... Um... You know, as I said earlier, uh, most of my patients still, if they get referred in for active surveillance, their initial biopsy was done without fusion. It was done just a, a standard systematic biopsy. Um, so uh, depending sort of on their risk, I mean, even among low risk patients, I'll sort of stratify, you know, are they very low risk? Is it a single core of low volume Gleason 6 disease? Or are they low risk, but potentially somewhat higher? Maybe they have high volume Gleason 6, or maybe their PSA is a little bit high. Um, so in the, the very low risk patients, I don't typically, at least me personally, I don't typically recommend genomic testing. I'll normally say we can probably hold off for about a year or so before we do your confirmatory biopsy, but I will try to get an MRI before that confirmatory biopsy and, and do that subsequent biopsy with fusion. Um, for the slightly high risk patient, you know, the high volume Gleason 6 or the one with the elevated PSA, uh, I do think genomic testing can be valuable in that setting. So I, I very often will order uh, some form of genomic testing. And then for them, I'll say, you know, potentially we should do your confirmatory biopsy sooner. So maybe more in the six month range. Um, mm -hmm. I do like to wait at least about three to four months after the initial biopsy before getting the MRI, because I think there can be hemorrhage in the prostate or inflammation and that that artifact can, can interfere with the radiologist's ability to interpret the MRI images. Um, but that six month period is typically by that point, you can get a, a reasonable MRI image. And I'll often you know, recommend the confirmatory biopsy with MRI ultrasound fusion at that point. And um, you know, anecdotally, there are a fairly significant number of patients that we find uh, you know, Gleason 7 disease or higher on that confirmatory biopsy because of the MRI results that, that might not have been detected um, you know, had we done the biopsy without the MRI. Yeah. 
there is a question from the audience uh, asking about how old is too old for a treatment and biopsy surveillance, you know, which is, <laughs> that is, uh, I mean, if you uh, uh, follow the AUA recommendations, uh, obviously, uh, in, in terms of life expectancy, they said, uh, even though we're not God, that 10 to 15 years, uh, uh, you know, is about the, 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 what you should do. However, it's a very uh, individualized uh, decision and, and treatment. I mean, an option that you take whenever you have this situation. Uh, you do have a young fellow with a lot of problems versus an old fellow with uh, no health problems at all. And, you know, they're, they're, they can survive for many, many, many years. So I guess uh, that is uh, a bit difficult to, to answer. Uh, Dr. Leticia Ruiz, she said, uh, excellent talks. I started doing transperineal fusion biopsies a year ago, and detection is much higher, especially in patients with previous negative biopsies and no infections. Yes, I guess that is a, a fact. Uh, trans, uh, rectal, the, the ones that we perform as well in the same way, the detection rate has been higher, I know, and, and probably the the I don't know what type of biopsies you you perform when you do this is uh, TP or TB or TR. However, um, we know that the infection thing, the anesthesia are basically, or the the location of the lesions are basically the the topics that the people is asking for. I mean, I do I do transrectals. Uh, Dr. Ruiz, uh, she's into the uh, perennial, uh, 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 for, uh, that's their, her preference for, for that. And obviously, both of us had had uh, good results with, uh, with this. Yeah, I still do primarily transrectal biopsies as well. Um, I do think, I mean, I think the results from the transperineal biopsies are very promising. I think the decrease in the infection rate is a, a huge potential benefit. Um, and at least, uh, you know, here at a, at a lot of our neighboring institutions, um, uh, once people get past the learning curve, they, they're doing a lot of transperineal biopsies in the office under local anesthetic. So it, it certainly can be done. I think it takes, um, there is a little bit of a learning curve to learn to properly anesthetize the patient. And, and it, it takes a little more time in your office uh, day than, than a transrectal biopsy would. But I think it can be done without general anesthesia um, you, once you become more comfortable with it. Yeah, there is um, even people who is doing focal therapy on their local and exactly. just uh, light sedation stuff. Uh, we don't do that here, uh, but in the U.S. I've seen uh, many centers where they are processing that that way as well. And, uh, you know, in terms of, I've been 30 something years in this business. However, I will say that uh, I've had very, very, and I mean, the rate of infections, if you do the proper coverage or preparation of the patient is uh, uh, fairly low. I'm, I'm not defending the 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 transrectal. That's but we've learned how to do it, and you know we have to compare and see what the future. In fact, this is what it's on the table now. You know the controversy of whether, and as I said initially in my talk, I mean who should be screened, how to screen, when, and and you know how to biopsy, how to diagnose, and how to treat these patients, and we still haven't had the answer for for that. So that is uh, uh, something that uh, um, probably in the future, it will be also uh, uh, found the, the right answer for it. You know? <laughs> All yeah. very difficult questions. So, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, I don't know if there's no more questions. I would like uh, to really uh, uh, say thank you for all of you to, for being here. And I know that you are uh, uh, one of the disciples of our uh, friend, Peter Carroll. And mm -hmm. in the last uh, EAU, am I sharing the screen? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, he said that in the, and that was uh, this weekend, the EA, EAU uh, was a virtual thing, but he's a very, you know, uh, great thinker. And he said that in the field of diagnosing and treatment of uh, prostate cancer, it is important to build infrastructure early on, seek opportunity and not convenience, and be prepared to think and act differently than expected. And he said it is vital to continue and build teams of great people with diversity in mind, in and outside of urology, as the best investment is and will always remain in human capital. 
So we have to work together to fight against this and we will have the best uh, of, the, of the world. Thank you. A great, great quote to end on, I think. Well, I think that's going to be the end for our webinar tonight. We really appreciate Dr. Adam Brees and Dr. Alvarado took the time to discuss with us today this great knowledge and, and we really appreciate all what you're doing for your patients. Uh, thank you very much everybody in the audience for your participation and your questions and stay tuned. We'll have the next session next Monday. Have a good night and thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>